In Virginia, a bank robbery explodes in violence. Put your hands up! Put your hands up! Spraying bullets from automatic weapons at anyone in their way, the robbers disappear. With no reliable witnesses, the police and the FBI have to decipher fragmented evidence to identify the shooters and then bring them to justice. Despite what you see in the movies, most bank robbers come in quietly, pass a note, and slip away. They want cash, not bloodshed. But in Richmond, Virginia, a pair of gunmen entered a bank with their guns blazing. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The raw violence of the crime shocked even the most seasoned investigators, who vowed to catch them before they struck again. Throughout the 1990s, Richmond, Virginia averaged about 10 bank robberies a year. Prior to 1997, not one of them was fatal. On the morning of January 30th, 1997, the employees of a small bank on the east end of the city began the day's business. Twenty-three-year-old Christine Edwards, one of the bank's tellers, arrived for work. Her colleague, twenty-one-year-old Tracy Freeman, was already there. Allison Davis, a customer service representative, and Richard Hartman, the bank's security guard, also began their day. Stephen Reed, a regular customer arrived shortly thereafter. He entered the bank as the tellers finished setting up and was greeted by Hartman. Good morning, how may I help you, sir? No one saw the two men slipping in the bank's rear door. First National Bank, how may I help you? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. When the men struck, they did so swiftly and without mercy. Eighty yards away, Richmond police officers Michael Webb and Dave Martin were at a convenience store getting coffee for their morning shift. Hey, 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 hey! Something's happening to the bank. Where? I heard gunshots in the bank. The bank. The bank right up the street. Back up. Hey, the gunshots at the bank. Right down the street. As the officers responded, Richmond dispatch ordered backup units to the scene. Sixteen respond. Nine twenty-nine. One sixteen. At the rear of the bank, the officers spotted a security guard lying in the parking lot. Officer Martin guarded the front as Webb went to check on the guard. He was still alive. Barely. Webb called for an ambulance. Then, two armed men emerged from the bank. Stop! 119.5 to 119.W. Shots are being fired, yes. Webb emptied his clip. The officer knew he was pinned down and outgunned. Uh, they stopped shooting. I stopped shooting. I just knew these two guys were going to come each side of the vehicle after me. Uh, I changed magazines and sat there and waited for a couple of seconds. 
Bet the gunman never came for him. Officer Martin left his position to back up Webb, but the assailant surprised him. With only a service weapon, Martin was outgunned, which allowed the robbers to get away from him. The officer could do was report their position as they escaped across the cemetery. Got a black male running with black jacket toward Diver Town Road. Two men. The Richmond officer saw a cloud of red dye, the sign that the gunman had stolen a bundle of money containing a time dye pack. The men leapt over the next wall, and the officer lost sight of them. The dispatcher forwarded the information to the Henrico County Police Department. Officer Martin searched the neighborhood, knowing two men with automatic weapons could be around any corner, but found no sign of the suspect. Patrolman arrived on the scene. EMTs arrived. They tended to the wounded guard outside. Richmond police entered the building. Police, everybody down! Stay where you are! Looking for any other gunman that might still be inside and to check the condition of the other employees. They found two tellers. Allison Davis had taken cover. Come on, come with me. Is she okay? Everything's okay. She was not injured, but paralyzed with fear and taken to the hospital for evaluation. After clearing the bank, the officers felt it was safe to let the EMTs care for the wounded. Her teller, Christine Edwards, it was too late. This gone. Okay. Tell me where it hurts. Tracy Freeman, in severe shock and bleeding heavily, was stabilized and rushed to the hospital. All right. Along with Richard Hartman, the security guard. At the Richmond Police Homicide Division, Detective Tom Leonard was disturbed by the robber's brutality. This was our most violent bank robbery that we can remember in our history. So our fear was they were in the neighborhood and we needed to get them off the streets. Leonard headed to the bank. Officers collected items dropped by the robbers when they fled including a Lorsen 380 semi-automatic handgun and the clip to a Tech-9, another semi-automatic weapon. A canine officer with a tracking dog began searching for the suspects. The dog followed a scent through the cemetery. On Art Avenue, the dog lost the trail. Rico and Richmond police canvassed the neighborhood, asking the residents if they had seen any strange men fleeing the area. Uh, Rita? But no one saw anything suspicious. Detective Leonard arrived at the crime scene with an evidence technician. Uh, we immediately shut down that bank, and the only people that were inside the bank was myself and forensic people. So as we went through the bank looking for forensic evidence that we could pick up and look at, we found a lot of spent shell casings, which were fired. We had some that were unfired. 
Those shells were 9 mm likely used in the Tech-9. Behind the teller's counter, investigators found a backpack, apparently left by the robbers. Inside was a piece of green tablecloth, a bottle of charcoal lighter fluid, a box of matches, and a note reading, please wait five minutes. We couldn't figure out what that was all about. On the surface of the teller's counter, investigators spotted several boot prints. Mm -hmm. They preserved each print with tape, which they would later compare with footwear collected from potential suspects. Because the bank was federally insured, police called in FBI Special Agent Wayne Waddell from the Richmond Field Office. At the bank, he and Detective Leonard checked a videotape that had recorded several surveillance cameras simultaneously. But there was a problem. Oh man, Tom, look at that. Problem. Something caused the film, in our opinion, to uh, to not be not be working correctly. It went one camera to another camera to another camera, and you, you were getting different angles from the uh, from the front door, the rear door, and from different teller positions. They would need to make still photos from the individual frames to get any useful details. Special Agent Eduardo Alford joined the investigation. He knew the FBI would not stop until the gunmen were captured. I'm sure if you talk to every person that was involved in this investigation, they would tell you the same thing. They, they wanted to stay on this case uh, around the clock, which essentially is what happened. Evidence collection at the bank lasted for hours. Later on in the evening, at around 5.30 or 6, we received word that Henrico County had uh, uh, received a report of a break-in. I went over to uh, the break-in site. It was on Art Avenue, across from the cemetery, not far from where the K-9 unit had lost the trail of the suspects. We didn't know if it had anything to do with the bank robbery or not. Uh, a, a young woman that uh, lived there with her father found the front door had been knocked open and went in the house and discovered a lot of items that appeared knocked around or perhaps taken. When Special Agent Waddell went inside, a Henrico officer pointed out a hole in the ceiling. It appeared someone had stepped through from above. feared someone might be hiding in the attic. No one was there. They searched for evidence. Investigators found a pair of boots. They also found a backpack and a coat. Inside was another note reading, please wait five minutes. They also found another green tablecloth. Red dye like that used in bank dye packs covered many of the items. So we absolutely felt that there was a connection between the, the house break-in and the bank robbery. But they didn't know how the two crimes were related. We had no idea why the bank robbers would come to that house. Was it an uh, inopportune moment? Did they know someone there? Uh, was there something that drew them there? Uh, was it happenstance? We, we had no idea. We interviewed the, uh, the owner and his daughter and the daughter's boyfriend. 
and you interview these people because what are these bank robbers, what are these suspects doing in your house? And we're trying to find, is there a link or is there not a link? The residents were equally confused. They reported that whoever broke into the house stole some men's clothing, suits and jackets. During questioning, the boyfriend acted nervous and claimed he had no information to add. Well, what time did you get here? At the hospital, a Richmond detective sought out the wounded victims who could provide eyewitness accounts. Yes, ma'am. But he was unable to see anyone. The two wounded survivors were still in surgery and could not be interviewed. Allison Davis, the customer representative who had escaped injury under her desk, was so distraught she had to be heavily sedated. Stephen Reed, the customer inside the bank, had been grazed by a bullet and had come to the emergency room on his own. But he was also of no help. He had Alzheimer's disease and could not remember any useful information. By the end of that first day, we still had nothing more than what we had to begin with. So we knew it was going to be a ways to go. It was going to be a tough case. In Richmond, Virginia, two armed bank robbers escaped with $10,000 cash, leaving two employees wounded, and 23-year-old teller Christine Edwards dead. The community was stunned, as was assistant U.S. attorney Nicholas Altamari. This girl was an angel. And these guys, they just walked into the bank without a word spoken and shot her dead. It's sick. Determined to find her killers, Richmond homicide detective Tom Leonard and FBI special agent Wayne Waddell had to pursue the case without the benefit of eyewitness accounts. The problem with, with the employees and the, and the customer that were in the bank is they were all uh, traumatized. Uh, we actually could not talk to any of them for several, several days. The detective tried to interview Allison Davis, the customer representative who had taken cover under her desk and escaped injury. But she was too traumatized by the ordeal. Hospital staff had to sedate her, and she was unable to speak. There were no witnesses available to tell investigators what actually happened inside the bank. All they had to understand those events was a flawed videotape of the surveillance cameras, according to Detective Tom Leonard. That really caused us a problem trying to piece things together because we were missing little bits and pieces of the video, so you didn't get to see the whole robbery occur like you normally would. Working with still photos captured from the surveillance video and records of the physical evidence recovered from the bank, the investigators pieced the crime together moment by moment. It was a complex series of events, all taking place in a matter of seconds. You could see where the bank had obviously opened, but the only people who were inside were the security guard, the, the bank representatives, and one customer. The customer was standing there at the, um, the walkway area where you go through your little lines talking to the security guard. The lead gunman headed straight for the teller's counter. The first guy bypassed the security guard without even looking at him, without even noticing him. In our minds, we realized the front guy was not worried about the security guard. He knew that the second guy was going to take him out. In the photos, investigators saw the second robber pointing the Tech-9 at the guard. The first robber reached the counter and shot both tellers, killing one. Crack that weapon and he walks all the way down here. Ballistics testing showed both were shot with the Lorsen 380 recovered outside the bank. The bullet hole behind the customer representative's desk showed the gunman turned and fired at her, but the shot missed. Investigators noted the unfired 9mm rounds found on the floor. This suggested the Tech-9 had likely jammed and the gunman ejected rounds trying to clear it. The photos revealed there was a brief standoff. While the second robber tried to clear his Tech-9, the first attempted to shoot the guard with a Lorsen. But that gun malfunctioned too. The Lorsen 380 
recovered outside the bank was found with a jammed cartridge. When the guns jammed, the customer, Stephen Reed, fled, followed by Richard Hartman, the guard. Unable to clear the Lorsen, the lead gunman pulled an AR-15 assault rifle and followed them. Spent shell casings and bullet strikes found outside supported witness statements as to what had happened next in the bank's drive through One witness saw a gunman chasing the fleeing customer. He grazed his arm. The guard tried his best to stop the killer, but was struck by multiple rounds. The gunman returned inside. Hartman was still alive. The witness watched as he entered the rear of the bank. He pulls open that back door. Investigators realized Hartman had risked his life trying to draw the robbers out. The robbers loaded a backpack with money, including one bundle that contained a dye pack. The guard approached, fired, but missed. Another witness saw the guard flee the rear of the bank. The lead gunman pursued him into the parking lot and fired. The final shot to the temple permanently blinded Richard Hartman. Moments later, officers Webb and Martin found him there. Agent Waddell and Detective Leonard now had a clear account of the crime. Since the robbers came into the bank shooting, investigators believed their intent was to murder everyone, to eliminate all witnesses at the bank. The contents of the robbers' backpack revealed a plan to minimize witnesses on the outside. The tablecloths and the note would, I think, to be put over the doors uh, to ward off anyone coming coming up to the bank. Give us five minutes, we're still cleaning. Give us five minutes, uh, we're not ready to open up yet. Something like that. With the bank to themselves, the robbers could take their time. The piece of evidence that disturbed investigators the most was the lighter fluid. They believed the robbers were planning to use it to set the bank on fire as they left. Investigators knew they were dealing with especially violent criminals who acted with no remorse. We need to get them off the streets. Our fear was these people were going get out into the community and commit some more murders because they'd already been bold enough to come into the bank and start shooting people. And we'd have to gunfight with these people to try to catch them later. And the criminals were well armed. They still had an AR-15, the civilian version of the military's assault rifle, and a Tech-9, a 9mm semi-automatic pistol. The one weapon recovered, the murder weapon, was a Lorsen 380 semi-automatic. A records check revealed it had been stolen weeks earlier. Investigators released details of the guns to the press and asked for the public's help in tracking down the weapons. It worked, according to Assistant U.S. Attorney Nicholas Altamari. We got lucky. We got very lucky. There was a, there was a person who was out there that overheard a woman that she worked with say that she thought that her husband sold those weapons. 
the FBI and the Richmond PD followed up on that lead and in fact did locate a, um, a gentleman who was a legitimate and licensed gun dealer. At first, the dealer was reluctant to talk to authorities. He didn't want to incriminate himself by admitting that he might have sold weapons used in a murder. After agents assured him he could not be held liable since the guns were sold legally, he admitted he had sold a Tech 9 and an AR-15 a few days before the robbery. Uh, yeah, I got it all right here. He located the ATF forms filled out by the purchaser. Investigators now had a name to move on. The gun dealer told us that he had sold the weapons to Jermaine Sims. And we got hold of uh, all of our, uh, all of the units, all the guys working the case. Everybody was out trying to locate him. They finally ascertained that Sims was out of town. While the search for Sims continued, investigators kept following their only other promising lead, the Art Avenue house that the robbers had broken into. We started checking everything we could find out about the owner and his family. The girl that lived there had a boyfriend. We started checking him out. So we started from scratch with just basically an investigation on every person in the house. The boyfriend, who had acted nervous during interviews, consented to a polygraph test. The polygraph examiner asked questions about the robbery and murder, while Special Agent Waddell observed. After an hour of questioning, the polygraph results were inconclusive. Did you rob that bank? The boyfriend could not be eliminated as a suspect. Special Agent Waddell knew he needed to re-examine the house and went back with a search warrant. This time, he returned with an FBI evidence response team. He was determined that a more thorough search would reveal a connection between the bank robbery and the break-in. The ERT technicians scoured the attic. Got two guns here, two. Behind a wall board, they found a Tech-9 semi-automatic pistol and an AR-15 assault rifle, precisely the type of guns used in the crime. They were still loaded, and their serial numbers were intact. Special Agent Waddell proceeded to check if these were the same guns purchased by Jermaine Sims. We wanted to verify that they were, in fact, the weapons that had been bought from the gun dealer and used in the bank robbery. So we called back to the office. We read off the serial number, make and model of these weapons. And they were compared to the ATF firearms form. They were the same weapons. A ballistics expert compared slugs recovered from the bank to slugs fired from the recovered AR-15. They matched, connecting that weapon to the fatal bank robbery. It seems certain that Jermaine Sims had indeed bought the weapons used in the robbery and murder. Now, the FBI and Richmond police needed to find him. In Richmond, federal agents determined two weapons used in a deadly bank robbery were purchased by a man named Jermaine Sims. Agents could not find Sims, but a background check revealed he was receiving government assistance. They followed up on that lead. At the social services office, an administrator confirmed that Sims regularly came in to pick up food stamps. She flagged his name on their computers and agreed to page the FBI the next time the suspect showed up. Agents went to the address listed on the ATF form and spoke to Sim's mother. She hadn't seen her son since she kicked him out the previous week.
Days later, Richmond agents received a page from the social services agency. Sims was there. The administrator stalled Sims until the agents arrived. They hoped he didn't suspect anything. When the agents arrived, the suspect seemed calm. Excuse me, Special Agent FBI. I need you to come with me. They asked Sims to come in for questioning. Reluctantly, he agreed. Go ahead and thank her for They took him to a nearby police station where investigators tried to get him to talk about the guns. But interviewing the suspect was no easy task, according to Assistant U.S. Attorney Nicholas Altamari. Sims was a difficult uh, person to deal with. He was, um, he was a person who was filled with hate and hostility. Um, he didn't want to be there. He didn't want to certainly cooperate with us. We were dragging bits and bits of information out of him, and he was really only providing us um, information that we already knew. Um, we were having a lot of trouble bringing him to the table, so to speak. Sims denied any involvement in the crime, stating he was at his girlfriend's apartment at the time of the robbery. Who lives there with him? Over several hours, Altamari kept pressuring him until finally Sims admitted he had bought the AR-15 in the Tech-9 with the intent to sell them later for a profit. He said he stashed the weapons at a friend's house, a man named Ra, but claimed he couldn't remember the address. A street called Main Street. Instead, he gave directions. Now, who else is this guy wrong? The interview continued while Special Agent Wayne Waddell tried to confirm Sims' story. Sims told us where this house was located and described the house to us. We went to the uh, locations. We could not find the house. Determined, Altamari confronted Sims with his deception. Do you think you're dealing with a bunch of amateurs here? But Sims maintained his story that he still knew nothing about the bank robbery. You've already told me that. By then, authorities had located Sims' girlfriend, who supported his alibi. But investigators had strong evidence connecting him to the crime. You're going to jail for the rest of your life. He was informed that he was under arrest for bank robbery. There's nothing like um, the silence of a, of a jail cell to focus somebody on, on their problem. And he had a huge problem. He had his name um, on the title to these weapons that were used in this, in this robbery. And we thought that if we gave him a little time to think for himself, that he would um, eventually come to the conclusion that it was in his best interest to uh, cooperate with us. After a okay. week of incarceration and repeated interviews, Sims decided to talk. Now, tell me about the guns. He said after he bought the guns, he left them with two friends, Rashid Jones and LaFawn Bobbitt. He still denied having any involvement in the robbery, but investigators continued to work on him. He admitted that, um, that of course, he knew that they had robbed the bank. He still claimed that he was surprised that they had used his guns to do it and expressed his outrage that they would have, they would have uh, done this to him and gotten him out. Sims said that after the robbery, Bobbitt and Jones came to his apartment wearing clothes he had never seen them in before. They told him about the botched robbery, the gunfight, and their escape. They explained that they had broken into the house on Art Avenue, choosing it at random. They stole some clothes and stashed their guns behind the wallboard in the attic. Come. 
As they were leaving, Jones accidentally stepped through the ceiling. They then slipped out, avoiding the patrolling officers. They had the money with them, but it was stained red from the dye pack. Police records revealed that LaFawn Bobbitt had 11 prior convictions and was free on bond from charges related to grand theft auto. Rasheed Jones had seven prior convictions, including grand larceny, and was on parole. Investigators reduced the charge against Sims from bank robbery to conspiracy. Now, with the identity of the killers in hand, the real chase could begin. After a 1997 bank heist that left one teller dead, Richmond, Virginia authorities believed they had identified the gunman as LaFawn Bobbitt and Rasheed Jones. They had no idea where to look for Jones but they did set up surveillance at Bobbitt's last known address. He's been in it for a while. Yeah. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ken Melson was determined to apprehend these men as quickly as possible. We had to get these two cold-blooded killers off the street as soon as we can, so we would eliminate the possibility that they could do the same thing again and someone else would get killed. And yet we had a lot of work to do collecting the physical evidence, getting it analyzed by the lab, they needed more time to build the federal case, but could not afford to have two killers on the loose. A prosecutor's office in Henrico County to charge Bobbitt with the burglary, the breaking and entering of the Art Avenue address. With respect to Jones, he was in violation of his parole, so we got a warrant for a parole violation. Special Agent Wayne Waddell received the go-ahead to bring in the fugitives on those charges. We had two agents watching LaFawn Bobbitt's house. The two come. agents were uh, Paul Messing and Eddie Alford. Call it down. And we finally get authorization to arrest LaFawn Bobbitt. I get hold of uh, Messing and Alford. They tell me that Bobbitt has just left his house. All right, thank you. The agent told the surveillance team to follow Bobbitt then headed off to back them up. The agents followed the suspect into town, where he boarded a bus. They kept in contact with Special Agent Waddell, updating him on their location. Soon, Waddell caught up. They decided to arrest Bobbitt at the next bus stop. Bus is right in front of me. All right, 10 I'm getting ready to come around you right now. Waddell pulled around front to get into position. The other agents pulled in behind. When the bus stopped, the agents were ready. Come on, Bob, if you're under arrest for parole, Bob, you put your hands up. Within moments, suspect LaFawn Bobbitt was in custody. Investigators executed a search warrant on Bobbitt's home. In his bedroom, they discovered a manual for a 380 Lorsen pistol, the same model used in the murder. They also found several spent 380 shells. For FBI Special Agent Eduardo Alford, this circumstantial evidence suggested it was Bobbitt who fired the fatal shot. It was actually the weapon that one of the tellers was killed with. Finding that shell casing was very helpful as far as determining which one of the subjects or suspects might have had possession of this weapon 
uh, on this particular day. The FBI lab identified Bobbitt's fingerprints on items left at the bank by the robbers. The first evidence directly linking him to the crime. Technicians at the FBI's Question Documents Unit compared the boot impressions found at the bank with boots recovered from the Art Avenue house and from Bobbitt's home. One of the latent uh, footwear impressions was consistent with a boot that was left at the Art Avenue address. Another latent was uh, found to be consistent with a boot found at Bobbitt's house at a later search. And so that circumstantially, again, not conclusively, but circumstantially placed Bobbitt and his apparel in that bank. The boots found in the attic likely belonged to Bobbitt's alleged partner in the crime, Rashid Jones. Federal prosecutors now charged LaFawn Bobbitt with the bank robbery and murder, but investigators still needed to find Rashid Jones. Three months after the crime, authorities received a tip from a store clerk. He reported a customer had attempted to pay with dye-stained bills. The clerk refused to accept them. Mr. Jones uh, had been in that particular area in the south end of Richmond trying to exchange some of this money. So uh, the Fugitive Task Force pieced that information together, and they were really able to, to hone in on that particular area based on the proximity of this particular uh, uh, merchant store. The FBI focused on that neighborhood, working all of their contacts. The effort paid off. The information that came in uh, was from uh, just a reliable source of information. Uh, somebody that uh, uh, was aware of uh, this crime and <clears throat> knew uh, Mr. Jones and was able to uh, pinpoint a location of where he was uh, hiding. Jones was staying in a rundown apartment building frequented by transients. Agents were able to obtain the cooperation of a man living there. The arrest was planned for 5 a.m. when Jones would likely be asleep. They called the location and spoke to their contact inside. He said Jones was there, sleeping, and he had a gun. The contact also warned there were other people in the apartment, and most of the lights did not work. As the arrest team approached the building, they went through a final briefing, reviewing photos of their target. They anticipated a dangerous confrontation. Jones was armed, desperate, and surrounded by innocent bystanders. In 1997, the Richmond Fugitive Task Force SWAT unit closed in on Rashid Jones, suspected of bank robbery and murder. They'd received a tip that Jones was hiding out in an apartment. From their contact inside, they learned Jones was armed and most of the lights did not work. There were several innocent people in the apartment. The building was dark and foreign, complicating an already difficult challenge in which SWAT had to take down an armed fugitive while protecting innocent bystanders. The team decided to sneak up on Jones silently. They hoped he had not been tipped off. When they reached the target apartment, an agent phoned their contact inside. FBI, we're here. The contact was escorted out of the building.
When they made it to the room where Jones was said to be sleeping, he was gone. So was his gun. Tension mounted as SWAT began searching the rest of the apartment. Get your hands up, man. Get your hands up. Come on, get up. Get up. They found and removed two other residents. Every room was cleared, except one. Bathroom. Jones, we know you're in there. Come out. Put your hands up, Jones. That's him. Let's go. <laughs> to the team's relief, Jones was unarmed and surrendered without a fight. The manhunt was over. Get on, sit up. Agent searched for his weapon. They discovered it in a closet, its firing pin broken. Had the gun been functional, the arrest might not have gone so smoothly. Jones was immediately charged with probation violation and later for the bank robbery. On February 25th, 1998, the trial of Rashid Jones and Lafon Bobbitt began. But it would not be an easy case. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ken Melson and his prosecution team were unable to use any of the people in the bank as witnesses. None of them could really testify for us because the guard was blind as a result of being wounded. One teller was dead. Another one had never had the opportunity to even turn around to see anything. And a third, tell, a third employee was unable to testify because she didn't see anything. She was under a desk during most of the robbery. Melson found a way to deal with the lack of witnesses by commissioning a digital recreation of the crime. We had to stand in for them digitally and show the jury what happened inside that bank. We were the witnesses' voice to the jury during the trial so that they could be involved and experience the agony of the victims, experience the, the moment of the bank robbery. And that would give them not only the true feeling of what went on in the bank, but the true carnage and intent of the defendants. After hearing six days of testimony, the jury convicted both gunmen on all charges. Assistant U.S. Attorney Nicholas Altamari. In the trial, they sat there smug as all get out. And it wasn't until after they were convicted that you could really see them start to worry, because then it was about them. Then they were worried. Bobbitt and Jones were each sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Jermaine Sims, who purchased two of the weapons used in the robbery, was convicted on conspiracy, accessory before the fact of murder, and several weapons violations. He, too, was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. As the victims and their families continue to heal, they and the city of Richmond know that Jones, Bobbitt, and Sims will never be a threat to anyone again. Mm -hmm.